Good morning, everyone. My name is Maureen Roden. Uh, I'm a leader from Severna Park, Maryland. And it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who's an advocate, whistleblower, and cradle Catholic from Buffalo, New York. Siobhan O'Connor started working for the Diocese of Buffalo in 2015. Last summer, her conscience compelled her to turn to the media to expose the abuse cover-up within the diocese. In addition to sharing pertinent documents with multiple media outlets, Siobhan also provided them to law enforcement agencies. Now Siobhan has become an advocate, both for the support of survivors and for the betterment of her church. Please join me in welcoming Siobhan O'Connor. I told my mom that I would cry. I didn't know I was going to start off crying. <laughs> um, it's such an honor to be here with you all. And, you know, I was nervous before 60 Minutes, um, but I'm nervous in a different way today because you all mean so much to me. And um, I just um, hope that, that what I will say from the heart, um, that you'll understand. Um, where I'm coming from because you all inspired me so much. So you're so important to me and to those listening um, through the live stream. Thank you all for inspiring me. In so many ways, I wouldn't have been able to do what I did without the survivors. Um, so I uh, will just start off with a brief little uh, slideshow of some photos that show my uh, experience, especially during the rose colored days of my time with Bishop Malone. There it is, okay. Uh, so I just wanted to show you my progression from a very joyful new hire working for Bishop Malone and to the whistleblower I am today. So this is a photo from very early on in my time working for Bishop Malone. The priest there with us is Father Richard. He's a native of Poland and he's been a priest in our diocese for 10 years. And he is also a survivor of sexual abuse by a priest of our diocese. Um, so I learned through his experience about much of the abuse that had occurred in our diocese, but I didn't know the scope of it by any means. And I still trusted Bishop Malone. I thought that he had this under control. I really did respect and admire him. And I, we also had some good times. Um, this next photo is from his 70th birthday party in 2016. And I like to say that this is the one good surprise I gave him. I gave him another <laughs> surprise. This was a good one. Um, but, um, so I really did enjoy working for him. And I was so grateful to be working for my church. I'm a lifelong Catholic. I've been a member of the Buffalo Diocese my whole life. And I couldn't believe my good fortune that I was able to work for the bishop in such a close capacity to use the skills and talents I had developed as an executive assistant to now serve my diocese. Um, we also had a good time the next year when the bishop's birthday fell on the day of the St. Patrick's Day parade back home. So we just recycled that banner and had it there for him on the parade route. And then in keeping with the Irish theme, I was also able to go on a pilgrimage with him in October of 2017. I had learned early on that the bishop had never been to Ireland. And I thought, gosh, well, I have. I feel like he should. So we were able to go to our shared homeland, which was really a remarkable trip. But it's this picture in particular that for me captures the, the, the good days, if I can call them that, of my time with Bishop Malone. I really was in humble, happy service to him. This was the first time I ever served mass. Um, they needed somebody last minute, and so I stepped in. Um, and that really is how it was for me during those first few years of my time with the bishop. But then you contrast it with this photo, and obviously the photographer was capturing the bishop there, but they caught me. <laughs> and. Uh, this picture for me really encapsulates what I was going through last year. There's such bewilderment and fatigue and confusion on my face. And I remember how that felt. I remember it because I had never experienced anything like what I did last year. It was as though everything was topsy-turvy. And 
I came from a very devout Catholic family. I've always loved my faith. And I never ever thought that by working for the church, I would be in a position where I actually feared that I would lose my faith. I truly did. And that all began last year in March when the bishop rolled out the IRCP in Buffalo. And I know this audience knows it, but in case someone listening doesn't, that's an independent reconciliation and compensation program. And Bishop Malone kind of told us in the weeks before March 1st, he said, you know, we've been working on this for six to nine months. We've been planning it. And we've been talking to other dioceses that have done the same kind of program. And I thought, gosh, you know, six to nine months. Okay, you know, this is kind of a lot, but we'll make it work. But within the first few days of this program having been rolled out, I realized that the only preparations they made were legal and financial ones. They did not make practical and logistical arrangements for the good of survivors. They just simply did not. And I was really struck in particular by something that Professor Jenkins said last night in his PowerPoint. He said that the system must not fail survivors when contact is made. And that really struck me because the first and foremost failure last year in the Buffalo Diocese was that there was this hotline established. And Bishop Malone was publicly saying to survivors, please come forward, call this number, tell your story, we want to hear from you. But that phone number rang to a phone in an abandoned office. There was no way you could get someone. It was an answering machine, essentially. And I was just so appalled at that, professionally, first of all. How in the world do you call that a hotline? I mean, it wasn't even a good answering system. And secondly, as a Catholic, I thought, here are these people who have suffered so immensely. They gather up the courage to make this call and they get a machine? I'm sorry, but that is not acceptable. And I just was so hurt for all the survivors who then called a second time and a third time. At one point, the victim assistance coordinator was 90 calls behind. 90 people who had reached out in good faith to try to have some kind of connection with this program and they got a voicemail. But there was kind of a silver lining to that. And that is that because there was such a backlog with those calls, survivors started calling the chancery where I worked and I took those calls and that changed my life. It really did. I'm not the same person I was before I took those calls in a hard way, but in a good way because I got to hear survivors sometimes they had never told anyone. And it's such a privilege to hear that. But then they would say, is the church gonna help me? And I said, I, I don't know. And I wanted to say they would, but I didn't truly believe that from what I was seeing inside. Because at the same time that this hotline was epically failing, the bishop was preparing to release a list of names of those credibly accused priests within our diocese. And the list they eventually put out in last March listed 42 names. And I knew immediately that that was woefully inadequate because I had seen their draft list of over 100 names. And I had seen their explanations for why priests couldn't be on the list because they were an active ministry, because it would require explanation, because it doesn't fit into their carefully crafted criteria. Those were the reasons they were giving. But at the same time, Bishop Malone was saying publicly that it would liberate and empower survivors if they saw their abuser's name in print. Well, that's a nice line, Bishop Malone, but it doesn't mean anything if half of the survivors aren't seeing their abuser's name in print, aren't being validated, and aren't being treated respectfully. But I was so grateful to be speaking to the survivors, even though Bishop Malone and Bishop Grosch, they kept, that's the auxiliary bishop, they kept trying to get me to stop taking the calls. The bishop would say, oh, I should have made it so that you were isolated from this. He was nervous because I was getting angry. I was getting upset. And Bishop Grosch would say, well, you're not qualified to take those calls. <laughs> and I said, well, I said, from what I'm hearing from these folks, they've spoken to you before. And they said it was horrible and they don't want to talk to you ever again. <laughs> and they're thanking me for simply saying that I believe them. I believe you, is what I was telling them. I think I'm qualified to say that because I mean it. So I'm going to take those calls. Initially I was taking them by default. Now I want them. I want to talk to all the survivors. Don't let anybody else talk to them. I want to talk to them.
So I did. I continued to take those calls. I even met with some survivors who came in person because they were so confused and frustrated by this hotline that wasn't. And it really gave me an experience of vicarious victimization. And I say that with great respect because I, I am not a victim. But I'm just saying that even being on the periphery of this pain is, is immense. And that's why I have so much respect for those of you who have actually suffered it, because even being on the very, very far sidelines is a tremendous weight. And I shared with the bishop a recurring dream that I was having. Uh, it was late March of last year. I told him in an email about a dream I had, and it happened consistently where I would have this dream that I was amidst dark, tumultuous water. It didn't even look like water. It was just darkness. And I was on this raft, and I was trying to save these children who were reaching out to me. And I never could. And I would wake up, like sitting straight up in bed, and I would just be sobbing because I, the last image was that I had these children in my arms and I hadn't saved them. And I said to Bishop Malone, I, I really think I'm internalizing this. It's so painful. And he never responded to that email. He never acknowledged that. And I really was so frustrated because I thought their perspective is all wrong. Their priorities are all wrong. Bishop Malone's attitude was, woe is me. Woe is me, I have to clean this up. I've inherited this mess, which is not entirely true. He contributed to it. And he also was saying, he constantly talked about he was the lightning rod for the crisis. It was always a crisis. Yeah, it was a crisis because it was his crisis. It wasn't a crisis when it was your crisis. And so he was constantly saying, it's true. Don't call it a crisis. Don't call it a crisis, Bishop Malone. It's only a crisis right now because it's a crisis for you. This is a tragedy and this is a scandal. But the crisis was the individual acts of abuse that were perpetrated by criminals and never properly brought to justice. So that was the, that was the crisis. They, sorry, <laughs> my temper starts to flare a bit when I think about these things. But, but he knew I was Irish. My name gives it away. So he, he knew what he was getting. Uh, but you know, the priorities were so wrong. It was all about, I'm the lightning rod for this. And, I might wake up and see my picture in the paper and there's demands and there's threats and there's questions. And then Bishop Grosh, our auxiliary bishop, his perspective was, woe is he? And the he was the accused priest. And it was all about, well, we gotta make sure that before we put their name in the paper that we call them, we call their family, we call their neighbor and make sure everybody knows. And then if a priest had to be brought in to be put on administrative leave, oh, this is gonna be so hard for him. The day that his closest, one of his closest friends came in, Father Fabian Mariansky, finally being brought in after escaping repercussions for a quarter of a century. And all Bishop Grosh could say that day was, oh, poor Fabe, that's what he called him. Poor Fabe, this is gonna be so hard on him. And I said, it's about time it's gonna be hard on him. It's about time. <laughs> it has to be hard for him. Sorry, but <laughs> it, it absolutely must be hard on him. And it's hard on you, Bishop Grosh, because it's your friend. I'm sorry. My perspective was, woe is they? Woe is the survivors who have been outcasts from their own church in so many cases. There's been no outreach of any real merit. And then you have this program rolled out that's really just about the legal and financial benefit of the diocese. It's about protecting their assets and their bank account. But their greatest asset, any church's greatest asset, is its people. We are the church. And they didn't protect you and they've been lying to us. And I was just truly outraged by it. And my conscience just burned within me. I've never felt my conscience that way, but it became this physical part of me. Every day I walked in there and my conscience hurt me. And at night it was sore, like a muscle, because I'd had to be in that building and I saw things and I heard things and I typed things. And I said, someday I'm going to die and I'm going to stand before God. And Bishop Malone is not going to be there standing before me. I pray he will eventually be with God, but he's not going to be there judging me. I have to stand before God as I stand before you all now. And I say that I could no longer abide by what they were doing. I knew that I might lose my faith. I felt like I was losing my mind. And I said, I'm going to have to leave this place because I value my faith even more than my life. But I'm not going to come out of here empty handed. I'm going to take the truth with me as much as I can get in my backpack and bike home with it. 
<laughs> and I'm taking it with me. <laughs> and I remember thinking that the voices of those survivors, all of you, I may not have spoken to you specifically, but I knew of you. I knew all the stories in that secret archives. I'd had to file things in there. I knew there were so many of you. And it's such an honor to actually be speaking to you. I can't even tell you how much this means to me because you inspired me so tremendously because despite your suffering and your trauma and your pain, which I could feel, it's so raw, it comes right through the phone. But I also sensed your strength and your resiliency. And we know there are many who didn't make it, not because they weren't strong, but because the pain is so great. So I'm so grateful that you're here and we need to be listening to you because you are the keepers of the truth. They may have some of it in their secret archives, but you are an embodiment of it. This is your life. And I just was so inspired by that, that these people need to be validated. They need to know that someone in there believes them and respects them and wants your voices to be heard. And I knew that the only way I could do that was by providing documents to the media and then to law enforcement to start the process of an investigation, to make sure that you knew that you could be empowered, maybe not by a bishop, but by the truth itself. And yet I was hearing at the same time before I left, Bishop Malone was always talking about who would lead us through this mess and who would show us the way. And before March of 2018, I would have thought he was talking about Jesus. But he was talking about Terry Connors, the primary legal counsel for the Diocese of Buffalo. <laughs> and I said, really, Terry's going to lead us through this? Really? He's been the legal counsel for the diocese as long as I've been alive. I don't think he's going to lead us out of this. He's going to lead us further into it or try to find a, some kind of far-fetched way around it. I said, Jesus will lead us through this, right? I never heard his name. That was the whole point I was there. Why? And I just want to say that if Jesus were alive today, and sometimes I wonder, you know, when are the thunderbolts coming? But if he were alive today, he would be with you. He would. And I know that for some of you, they took your faith. They may have taken your God from you which is a beyond earthly crime to take someone's God from them. But Jesus, if he were here, he would rock right past those bishops and cardinals, those Pharisees and Sadducees with their tassels and their phylacteries and their mansions and their mitres. And he would come to you. He would be with you and he would say, I'm so sorry that these men and women who were supposed to serve my church. They hurt you. They did. They hurt you. And if no one's ever said it to you from the church, if you've never felt it from the church, I say I am sorry that you were hurt in the name of God. What an immense suffering. What an immense injustice that can really only be repaired in the life to come, but you deserve every ounce of justice you can get in this life. And I join you in that fight because I kept looking for truth and justice and compassion in the chancery. And truth was scarce and locked away and justice was hard won and the compassion was so weak. They told me I was overly sympathetic to survivors. How can you be overly sympathetic to survivors? You can't. I've tried, I'm try I, I, I would be as overly sympathetic as I could. I was just being myself. And hearing your stories, and they said, you're overly sympathetic. You should be more sympathetic to the bishop. No, I clearly was not. <laughs> and I don't even know what time it is because I've become so overwhelmed by everything. So I hope I haven't gone on too long, but I just want to say that you inspired me so much and so did Jesus, because I really do believe that, you know, he flipped tables on the money changers. He's not coming in to flip tables. He's coming in with a wrecking ball. Okay, and you are his wrecking ball, okay, because, because this is not his church. This is not the church that I grew up in and loved. This is not, Jesus would say, tear this down and get some millstones ready because this is not the church. 
And there's always redemption, and we strive for forgiveness in the capacity we are able to. I respect that. But along with that hope, there also has to be action. There has to be truth and justice. Our God, the God I believe in, and I believe all religions have, have a focus on truth and justice and compassion. We all share that. And in the Catholic Church, that's what's always inspired me. That's why I want to be Catholic. That's why I hope I always will be. I didn't want to lose my faith to these men. I would say, I can't let the bad guys win. I can't let them take my faith from me. It's so precious. It informs and inspires me. And I'm so grateful that I'm still Catholic. It's hard some days, but I say I'm Catholic because of Christ and his teachings, not what this business approach, what this institution has done. It's corrupted that teaching. Jesus wouldn't know his church today, but he would know you because he's always been with you. And it's a mystery. The human capacity for evil is such a mystery, but I just keep trying to focus on the divine capacity for justice and for good. And we see it in each other, don't we? There's such goodness here. I have such hope being with all of you. It really is such a comfort. So I just want to end by, well, what this one other picture I thought you guys would appreciate. Uh, so this one, I think it may have frozen a little bit here. Um, this one, <laughs> this one was in the paper a lot before they knew that I was the whistleblower. <laughs> and um, so I like to call this watch your back. <laughs> So if you ever wondered if anyone listened, if anyone cared, if anyone believed you, I come to you as one who did. And I pray and I trust that there are others. And I don't know why there aren't more coming forward. I really hoped that there would be. But I know they're in there. I know there are good people. I think of my family and my loved ones who are Catholic. And they're such good people. There is such goodness there. It's been poisoned and corrupted. But there is goodness there. And I thank you for respecting that. And I want to just close by saying that it is such an immense honor to be here with you today. It really is. It's overwhelming, really. A year and a day ago, I released the first of 600 pages of diocesan documents to Charlie Specht, the journalist back home. It's just been a year. And last year, I didn't know what was going to happen to me personally, to our diocese. I knew our church was in chaos. And I certainly could never imagine that a year later, I'd be with all of you but I can't think of a place I'd rather be and people I'd rather be speaking to you because you inspired me so much, you and Jesus, to do what I did. And I've had an immense and lasting peace ever since then. I hope you can find peace too because more than anything, you deserve that. And I just want you to know that Jesus loves you just like the old song. And I truly love you. And I will pray for you every day of my life. Thank you. so much i think there's time for two questions oh <laughs> okay <laughs> it's gonna Right. There were there were abuse files. Um, there was a lot of pending litigation that had been prepared for Bishop Malone. Well, I found a binder of 300 pages of pending litigation in the bishop's vacuum closet. So I would say that they are not. Yes. Since then, he said that it was just a closet. It wasn't named the vacuum closet, but the vacuum was in there. So we called it the vacuum closet. <laughs> So yes, that one was particularly shocking because it was this huge binder of pending litigation. As, as I'm looking at, I'm looking at Mitch and Jeff and thinking no good lawyer is going to provide this information to have it sit in a vacuum closet. It was clearly meant to be read and acted upon, or at least to have informed the bishop.
but he had it in a, in a vacuum closet in a drawer there. Um, the other items, nothing that I, I didn't have to steal anything. Um, I, I didn't steal anything. I made copies well, of I things. <laughs> uh, but honestly, I had access to everything. It was in the secret archives, in specific priest's files. I was particularly focused on two cases where Bishop Malone had had direct uh, decision making in recent cases where he had allowed priests credibly accused to continue in ministry. I felt that that was the most important type of case to focus on. I could have I mean, I could have brought out so many cases, but I felt that the public needed to know that this is a current problem, that bishops are maybe not quite in the scope that they were in the 70s and 80s, thank God, because they can't get away with it, but that there are still decisions being made that are not in the interest of, of the people. So that's what I focused on. There were also a lot of memos, a lot of emails, um, and then also I, I wanted to have certain uh, certain items like that draft list of names. I thought that was very important to show the thought process be behind their actions. Um, so there's quite a wide variety of items. Most of it was from the secret archives itself, which is a locked part of the chancery. And ever since the leak occurred last year, they went Fort Knox on the place. They now have all sorts of security measures in place. They went from low security to high security in about 36 hours. So any other question? Yes, Asher? I was wondering how you deal with the backlash that you must be getting. Well, that was difficult at first, uh, especially from, from faithful Catholics, because I think for a lot of them it was a defense mechanism. I was hurting the church. I was airing the church's dirty laundry. It was easier to say that I had done something wrong than to realize that I was simply making wrongdoing public. And I would say to people, well, if they had been cleaning up the laundry, the dirty laundry, maybe that would have been one thing. But they weren't. They just had it on a spin cycle. And so I try to tell people, um, so I, I've become better about not letting it get to me personally, and God has helped me so much with that. Um, but now I really just tell people, well, wait and see. If you don't believe these documents in black and white, that's your prerogative, but just wait and see. It's difficult for people sometimes to accept the truth. You know that better than anyone. But I always tell them, I just say, well, then wait. And some people who didn't like what I did in October have come to me recently and said, you know, I never thought I'd say this, but you were right. And I said, well, it takes some time for people, but we'll give them that time. We've got all the time in the world. They've already taken so much of your time. If they need a couple more months to figure it out, I'll give it to them. Yes. Siobhan, I was wondering, um, for others who may be in a position like you, who works in the cancer department, those actions, those files, are you covered as like a whistleblower, right? If you turn documents over to law enforcement, then that's protected in a sense, is it not? Yes, and I'm, again, I'm looking at, at Mitch and Jeff, and uh, I would recommend that anyone who's interested in doing what I did, please talk to one of them. <laughs> because Bishop Malone is scared to death of those two men. <laughs> I knew I was going to go with Charlie Speck, the journalist back home, because the bishop called him the true evil. And he called the two of them the sharks and the vultures. And I said, those sound like my people. <laughs> yes, Trish. Oh, well, that's very kind. Thank you. Well, really, just being here has been so such a, a, a tremendous gift. I'm so grateful to Zach and his leadership team for inviting me. Um, and just knowing that it seems so simple, but hearing from survivors that just my saying, I believe you, it, it seems like that's such a, a powerful thing. And it seems like well, it, but when it's meant, I think it's it's so powerful and so meaningful. And so just hearing that, that hearing the 60 Minutes broadcast helped you, or maybe that it's helped you to maybe consider that, that God might not always be absent from your life. I know they took God from you in so many ways, but but whether it was a priest and nun, a deacon who took God from you, God is greater than that. He's greater than that. So that would be what I would say, if you could please give God a chance. Please, thank you. Thank you so much.
I mean, what a gift. Uh, uh, what a gift to have Siobhan here and, and to hear from her. And what a gift of analogy, by the way. My goodness, uh, constant phrases that were just wonderful. So, so grateful for your example and your advocacy. And thank you for being here, Siobhan. So we're going to move into our uh, first break really quick and then head to our breakout sessions. So um, excited about that. And I just have a couple more housekeeping items. They should start me cleaning the halls pretty soon with all these housekeeping things. But um, check, remember that, you know, that there's going to be signs on all the breakout rooms out there that say what they are. And there's a map in the program book in case you get a little bit lost. I have repeatedly, despite the fact it's just a hallway, so no judgment. And um, if you do get turned around and need some help, just check out, you know, folks with the, the red or the green lanyards and they'll help you out or come to get me. And then just um, a couple announcements about some folks who are here, some media folks who are interested um, in connecting a little bit more. And we have a gentleman named Will Carlos. Uh, stand up, Will. So, so Will is a documentarian. And if any of you saw the film Fugitive Fathers, he's the man who is behind it. And he's trying to do a deeper dive into um, looking in this issue and priests who may have been moved and moved uh, overseas. So if you'd like to talk with Will about this topic, he's back there. He's interested in hearing from you. We also have uh, some friends from the Associated Press who uh, I think they're out back uh, and the, the couch is out back there, but uh, uh, Juliet and Matt, and they're interested in looking at the uh, diocesan review boards. So again, if you're interested in talking to them, they're there, they're wearing yellow lanyards. I just wanted to make sure you, you knew who they were. But so that's that. And with that, we'll take a 10 minute break and then meet you all in our, in our breakout session. So thanks so much.